Hey everybody, just a walk through real quick at the beginning in, of the intro for the Living History Farm. We're inside of the barn. A lot of history in here. And I can't go any further. They got me blocked with the uh, farm equipment. There's a wagon right there. Little models of some of the farmhouses that used to be around here. This is the other part, other side of it. Wood chips. There's a potato planter right there. And I'm going to pause and get back with you in a short bit. Hey, Tony here. Um, as uh, the intro, Sherry said in the intro, um, we're out at a living history farm in Van Buren County, Iowa. It's really not that far from our house. I thought it was an appropriate setting for talking to you today about um, history. Uh, namely, the history of foraging and cultivating the plants that we use for food and medicine. So, um, if you'd like to come along with me, please do. Uh, we'll get into that right away. So yeah, come on. We'll go check it out. So, uh, people have been uh, foraging for wild edibles and medicinal plants since the dawn of mankind and almost as long have been taking some of those plants uh, that they found particularly useful and starting to cultivate them. Uh, some of those uh, did very well and over centuries um, have gotten to what we find in the grocery store today. Um, because they do mass uh, amounts of crops and they want to grow them as fast as possible and as big as possible, they don't always have the vitamins and minerals. They're not always as healthy as they should be. In fact, they usually aren't. Um, the wild edibles that you find are t tend to be a lot more potent some of them are, are more bitter because of the vitamins. Our uh, palate has changed so that we're accustomed to flavorless food, basically. So uh, I like this spot because not only does it have a living history farm, but it also has a whole mix of different types of environments, uh, like pond, Creek for uh, plants that like wetland type areas. And boy, after the rains, I gotta tell you, it's pretty wet out here. And uh, upland forest and open spaces for the plants that like that type of stuff. And of course, the animals also that like that. Uh, so there's just a whole variety of types of stuff in this 100 acre patch of woods. Uh, so it's it's kind of cool. I kind of like it. But uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, folks have been 
foraging since the dawn of mankind. But throughout the ages, things have changed. Uh, people got more permanent and where they're staying at, and that's why they cultivated certain plants so that they didn't have to keep looking for them. Um, and uh, humans have always been on the move. So when humans are on the move, they move into a new area where there's different plants and they have to learn about those plants so that they don't get sick, so that they know how to use them, things like that. And they usually would learn from the people who live there to begin with. So let's explore some more around here and we'll talk some more about that. So I'm sitting inside a colonial um, log cabin. Uh, some of these buildings here have been here for a very, very long time. The barn that we were in is about 100 years old. And uh, I think this, uh, this cabin goes back to 1746 or something like that. So really old. Of course, it didn't have the concrete floor and all of that. Now, uh, as I was saying, uh, people have been foraging uh, for wild edibles since man began and cultivating certain plants for almost as long. For example, um, in the Mediterranean, <clears throat> there were plants, wild wheat, wild oats, um, in, in the Americas here, wild corn and beans, and uh, they've evolved into what, what we're uh, growing in mass quantities today. Um, the reason that uh, people cultivated mainly is because they wanted to settle in one area, and if they just kept foraging in that small area, they would quickly run out of those plants. And they found if they uh, tended some of them, uh, they could have more of it and uh, have a source for that year round. So um, scientists have, have looked at uh, earthenware pots uh, in Egypt. And they have gone back and, and genetically analyzed the contents that were left in them. And they found that uh, they were using things like barley and oats and wheat. And that they were actually making beer. So uh, at the time when the uh, pyramids were being built, there were people drinking beer. They found that the beer was really high in calories, so it gave them the uh, energy to keep working. You know, it wasn't so much to get drunk. I'm sure they were doing that too, but uh, also wild grapes uh, were getting cultivated so that they had a, a regular food source there. Um, cotton started off in uh, the Nile Valley. Um, and Egyptian cotton is still considered to be really kind of the finest in the world to this day. So uh, they cultivated that and started making clothes. Uh, they used papyrus to make paper. So, uh, and of course, all the medicinal plants that go along with that. Now, when it comes to America, you know, people have always been on the move and for religious purposes, you know, freedom, um, and just to get uh, their slice of the American apple pie that hadn't, hadn't been born yet. Uh, people came here mainly from uh, England to begin with. When they got here, they had no idea what they were doing. They didn't know what the plants were. They didn't know what they could eat and not eat. Uh, some of the plants they brought with them, like dandelions, uh, they brought that with them um, and some uh, trees like chestnut trees uh, they brought that with them and some seed like uh, oats and barley they, and wheat they brought that with them um, but uh, they had to learn from the Native Americans 
<laughs> and they were living in structures like this. When, when they first got here, they were living in structures very similar to this. And, you know, this is before America be became a country. Um, so there are different points in history when foraging became much more important. For example, during the American uh, Revolutionary War, that the colonists were accustomed to getting things from England off of ships, and sometimes France off of ships. And that had all of a sudden been cut off to them. So uh, they had to turn to the Native Americans once again, and they had to go out and forage to make up some of the food that they weren't getting. Uh, they had to hunt for meat and, they, and fish. Uh, they'd been doing that all along, but medicinal plants, uh, they had to learn that stuff, and they had to supplement their their food sources with things that they could find in the wild. Uh, during the American Civil War, so after the, the Revolutionary War, they got all comfortable again uh, on their plantations and whatnot, and, uh, you know, didn't really think that much about that. But during the American Civil War, times were tough, boy. Uh, the South and the North both but mainly the South. Uh, the South was cut off. There were uh, blockades, so that things weren't coming on ships. Um, they didn't have access to fields. Uh, most of their young men were off fighting, and they didn't have them to tend fields and harvest stuff. So uh, the, the people went back to foraging. For example, you may have heard the term polk salad. Uh, like Polk Salad Annie, the song. Um, that's actually an old Appalachian term that goes back to Ireland. Poke meaning bag or sack. Uh, they would take a bag out, a small sack, like a flour sack, and gather things that they could use as greens um, to make a salad. So that's where that comes from. And they, they used chicory because they didn't have access to coffee or tea. Uh, they used uh, what little bit of dandelions were there at that time. They really exploded over the years, obviously. Uh, so, and, and medicinal stuff. Um, they would go out and forage for certain types of moss to control infections, things like that. So... Uh, skipping ahead now, people got all comfortable again, and then World War II came, and there was a huge shortage. Everybody in America was rationed. Everybody in England was rationed. You had a ration book that told you how much meat you could get, which for a family of four, I think it was uh, a quarter pound of beef per week. So, not a whole lot. Um, so they were supplementing once again uh, with what they called victory gardens. So they were cultivating, but they were also going out and collecting walnuts and hickory nuts and, uh, you know, everything that they could use as, as a food supply to, to feed the family, to keep things going. So, uh Things have always gone like that. Uh, the future is uncertain. Um, it's so great to see so many people enjoying this page and participating. Uh, we've got about seven, we're almost at 700 right now, which to me is phenomenal. I'm really, really happy about that. And would like to see a lot more um, people who want to share what they know and want to learn some more. Because once again, the future is uncertain. I wouldn't, by any stretch of the imagination, call myself a prepper, but I do believe in being prepared. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the state of things right now. And um, I, I do want to remind you, though, um, go and check out uh, 
Midwest Wild Edibles on YouTube also. Unless you're on YouTube right now and you're watching this video on, on YouTube, if you are, uh, hit the like button um, and, and share. And that way you'll get uh, updates in the future. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Um, and join that group as well. There's a lot of videos that you may not have seen yet if you're on the Facebook page and, and vice versa. So check that out. And thanks once again. And I'll probably have uh, Sherry do a little more uh, video of the area just to finish this one off. But have a wonderful week. Hey, back here at the living history farm continuing the end of the video and this is a little one room schoolhouse there's a little bathroom or shack storage thing right there and it's there's the pond again and i'm gonna pause a little windmill tower there i'm gonna pause and continue at the next spot and we're back at the where the barn is and there's the little storage shed or whatever it is i don't know but there's the barn and the little corn crib corn puller and a little Grain house, grain house out there, and one more sweep through the whole place. And there you have it Living History Farm in Southeast Iowa. Later, till next time, ciao.